the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there making a whip of cords. He drove them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coin of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things out of here. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, Ha! It has taken 46 years for us to build this temple, and you're going to raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When, therefore, he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Believe and see the promise. God's word is certain, and the word is what walks right into his temple on this day. And lo and behold, what does he find? For crying out loud, the temple, the place where God is in communion with his children, the place where God's children can come to be in communion with him, the meeting place of heaven and earth. And what do we find? Nothing but the catastrophe of convenient clutter. Oxen and sheep and doves and tables set up for the convenience of people to change their currency for the temple tax and to purchase the animals for the sacrifices. Can you believe it? It's just as ridiculous as having offering envelopes sitting on pews instead of allowing people places to put their rear ends. Only because of the convenience, only because of this clutter, does Jesus clamor with a whip of cords and drives them out like slaves and declares that the kingdom of God is at hand. Believe and see the promise. God's word is certain. Take these things out of here and stop making my father's house a house of trade for this temple court and temple ground was not simply the place of the Holy of Holies, not simply the place where Jews could gather, but Jesus, cognizant and conscious of the consequential and convenient clutter of this catastrophe, identified the temple courts as the place where the Gentiles could be. And instead of having room for those who would be coming from other places, those who were the holy rollers, made things convenient for themselves. Jesus said, fulfilling the words of the prophet Zephaniah, get this clutter out of here and make room for those who should be here. Make room for the world to believe and see the promise. God's word is certain. And that zeal for his father's house not only had consumed him, but as the disciples indicated, it will consume him. For Jesus had come into the world to suffer and die on a cross for you and for me. It is the sign that Jews had been seeking but not realizing. It is the folly that many Gentiles and Greeks had ignored. But for us, it is the power of God unto salvation. And now that power and that word was in their midst, just as it is in our midst. Believe and see the promise. God's word is certain. Away with the convenient clutter of the catastrophe of our lives and make a whip of cords, O zealous Jesus. And if you can, please get somebody to put it in a stained glass window. How tired I am of seeing these other images of Jesus. I prefer a more passionate Savior. One who is so passionate not about his hatred of oxen and sheep and doves. After all, he made them. And not because he hates the money changers, he made them too. 
but because he recognizes that this space needs to be an open space for all God's children to gather together so that all who might be fasting and all who might be praying and all who might be almsgiving might see that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many serving. That is our red letter challenge word for this week. It's all about serving. And that's why Jesus decided to put a whip of cords in his own hands and drive that stuff out of there and make room for a new sacrificial system, a sacrificial system not dependent on temple taxes and coins, a sacrificial system not dependent on oxen and cattle, but a sacrificial system grounded and founded in the pure and sinless Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and that's exactly who Jesus is. And now that he is in his temple, my friends, there's no more room for any of this other stuff. That old stuff needs to go. The new day has already begun. It is not that the end is coming, my friends. This is the beginning of the end. The end is now believe and see the promise. God's word is certain. And as it is, he's clearing things out and making room and making space for all of God's children to join. No wonder the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us that allows you to do these things? Ha! Huh. As if his turning water into wine was not enough a few verses earlier, Jesus shows them, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. They question his ability to do it, as if Jesus himself were not a creative contractor. Don't they realize when they said, it took us 46 years to build this place, how can you do it in three days? Police! Jesus could rebuild that temple in 46 seconds if he wanted to. After all, he is the creator, is he not? But he wasn't even talking about that. He was talking about the temple of his body, the great encounter place of God and God's children, that all would be reconciled in him and through him and with him, and that all of God's children might now recognize that there is a place for them in the temple courts, a place for them to receive God's gifts, a place for them to be baptized into Jesus' death and resurrection in the waters of baptism, and to a place for them to receive his precious body and blood for forgiveness, life, and salvation. Precious, saving, perfect blood, perfect sacrifice, perfect gift offered for them and their salvation, all because he came to serve. And as he comes to serve, he calls upon those religious folks to do the same. Maybe that is the hard word for all of us to hear when we think that sometimes a worship service is designed simply to serve us and that our needs always have to be met and that someone needs to tell us what a good job we're doing and how well you have been wearing your mask this week. And oh, look at you able to wash your hands by yourself. Coochie, coochie, coo. Please get a grip. Get over it and recognize this is not simply about you. This is about others who don't even know who Jesus is. And it's about everything that we can do in our power to make sure that we clear out the convenient clutter of our own lives and allow for Christ's good news to be made known to everybody everywhere. The prophet Zephaniah reminds us that there will be no money changers on that day, the last day when Jesus comes back in glory. And now, in this gospel, the last day has already begun. Believe and see the promise. God's word is certain. And as it has begun, God's children have already been brought through the Red Sea waters. They've already been brought to the mountain of Sinai and already engaged in a new covenant relationship, as Mr. Abner had reminded us today. For those words are not a club meant to beat us on top of the head as much as they are words to remind us that true service of God involves true service of our neighbors. That's why you shall have no other gods, and you shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God. And we remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. All those things done so that... We, like Christ, may serve each other by honoring our father and our mother, not 
killing, not committing adultery, not stealing, not bearing false witness against our neighbor, not coveting our neighbor's house and not coveting our neighbor's male, female, slave, ox, donkey, or anything that belongs to our neighbor. It is those words, that decalogue that reminds us of our new life in Christ, a life of service. And that service means that there are things that need to be cleansed and purified from our own lives to make room in our planners for devotional time, to clear time and space out so that we can get into our portals of prayer, to move the junk on the table and reestablish our home family altars and to rebuild households of faith so that more and more people might know the healing balm of Gilead that brings consolation to sin-sick souls. And they might know that the commandments of the Lord do indeed enlighten the eyes and show us that sometimes things we set up for our convenience serve as an impediment for those who need to hear the good news of Jesus. Church, it's time for us as God's holy people to repent, turn around, and be renewed in this season of repentance and renewal, and doing so by the power and grace of the Spirit, we embrace the word serving in a brand new way. For, you see, being with God, week one, and receiving the forgiveness of God, week two, we're engaged now in serving God by serving our neighbor just as Jesus did, with great zeal in our hearts and lives, ready to do whatever we can to put clothing on those who are naked, to give food to those who are hungry, to speak words of reconciliation to those who are discriminatory and divisive, and to move aside any of those things in our life that might impede the path to the kingdom and glory of God for others. In that compassionate love, Jesus comes to us today, and as he does, he shows us the world thinks this kind of cross-bearing is folly and foolishness. But we know that as a suffering servant, Jesus brought people to himself, and we, as his body, are destroyed that we might be raised on the third day as well. For all of these things are pointing to a new day, and it is a resurrection day. A resurrection day not only of a 33-year-old itinerant rabbi who lived 2,000 years ago, but it is resurrection day to which all this points for Christ's body, the church, to embrace this day as kingdom day. Believe and see the promise. God's word is certain, so certain that it fills us with a zeal for the gospel that lets us pray with renewed earnestness and courage, that gives us grace to lovingly fast from those things that impede our devotion, and to generously give alms, funds, money, time, talent, treasure, so that more and more people might know the redeeming acts of Christ. It is in this temple work that we recognize that God's not interested in the bricks and the mortar that take us 46 years to build. He's interested in the people he has saved by his blood, and especially those who don't even have space to come and join us yet. By God's mercy and grace, my friends, there's something more messianic and magnificent than a mask, something far more victorious than a vaccine and more powerful than the world's puny pandemics. And what it is instead is the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. And we will be about sharing it. We will be about receiving it. And we will be about doing everything we can so that the world may embrace it as we sing in the cross of Christ I glory, towering o'er the wrecks of time, all the wants of sacred story gather round its head sublime. We shall know that no matter how challenging it is, and no matter how challenged we are, with zeal like Jesus, we don't mind putting a whip of cords in our hands and reclaiming that which belongs to Jesus. Even if they are our children or our grandchildren, our time and our space, our schedules, and our cluttered calendars of convenience, let God reprioritize our lives and let that happen in this season of Lent as we look forward to the day of Jesus' return so that together we may believe and see the promise that God's word is certain and that resurrection day 
is already upon us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.